to see if that guy will lure a couple more in. Tiny freeloaders pausing to tank up. This little black chin, little pollen on her head. It's best not to uh, get antsy and try to uh, catch them and miss them, then that, that spooks them a little bit. Actually, there's a lot of fishing components in this whole contraption. Oh, and there's always that happens too. The old under the arm trick. But mostly, the fishing's good. This is the big migration time. And they just keep bringing work. If you uh, enjoy bird watching and want to see large, as many species of hummingbirds in the United States, it's southeastern Arizona that you would come to first. With 300 plus species of hummingbirds worldwide, bird watchers can see more than a dozen varieties right here. They're alert. They're um, in the hand. They're just a bundle of energy, although they do calm down and become pretty quiet. The Hummingbird Monitoring Network has set up camp just outside the Patagonia home of Lee Rogers and Susan Wethington. Wethington founded the network in 2002. I was one of these people that changed careers midlife and realized that um, biology was my love. I went back to get my doctorate and my dissertation was on hummingbird foraging patterns. Though other birds are studied and monitored, Hummingbirds are basically winging it out there on their own. And when I graduated, I realized this hole in conservation and of course living where I live on a hummingbird migration route, it would have been impossible to forget hummingbirds. Oops, that was a miss. <laughs> They're fast. Once birds are captured, they queue up for an exam. The assembly line work is fast and efficient. And this is the grip that I use for all the measuring and such. When they come to the table, we have a protocol that ensures that no one bird is held longer than 30 minutes. And that only occurs when there's a lot of birds. It's more like a, a doctor's office visit. A lot of details come forward in a short amount of time. I can look at all the information that I need from a bird and band it in less than two minutes, typically. You need to know what species, what age, and, or what species and what sex the bird is before you know what size band to put on. Banding allows the network to track individual birds, estimate their populations, even determine how long they live. Having them in a bag or restrained is the preferred way for banding these days hummingbirds. That way you can put a band on and ensure that the band's on correctly before the bird has any chance to escape. Details are carefully recorded. Okay, so let's see if there's any fat on her. No, but there's a lot of body mold. Fat's typically okay. put on when the bird's preparing to migrate. And it's always a joy to see a fat migrant. <laughs> Some birds weigh about as much as a copper penny, but their appetites are voracious. They need the fuel for the travel time to Mexico, where many of these species will spend the winter. The band number is 133. The network is active in several states, with multiple sites in Canada and one in Mexico. It's a science-based program that encourages research. The monitoring number one brings up questions that we need researchers to answer um, and researcher then provides uh, information for us to know how we might need to change uh, what we do okay and this is an adult female black chinned is it habitat protection or, or what's necessary to um, try to help this species survive? So there's a real strong preservation component. 
The network is nonprofit and relies on hundreds of volunteers to work when birds are active. In this region, that's early March through October. She looks well worn. These banders know a lot, not just about hummingbirds. Without looking up, they can tell you what other species of birds are flying through. And uh, it's, it's a great way to learn about where you live. When they become a citizen scientist, they say, number one, we realize this is a science program and that we have to follow protocol and that they're responsible for ensuring that the protocol is followed at the site that they manage. And that's the second point, they manage a site. Violet crown is a um, Mexican species that comes into the U.S. here. And Patagonia actually is one of the best places for people to come to see violet crown. You can take a look here and see. Yeah, this is a little Anna's female. She needs a good drink. Oh, yeah. Some birds have a tendency to linger. Well, we've got other birds that need to be fed, so. They're just wicked fast sometimes. The network's commitment to education and conservation may help slow the troubling rate of extinction. If a species is truly extinct, we've lost something. Now, extinction is a normal process, but the rate at which species are going extinct is unheard of today. There's no pollen and no fat, and she's fresh all around. The five-hour session has ended well, and the capture numbers are respectable. Eighty-eight birds, and probably a full third of those birds are juveniles, which is great. It may be that science and the human species will help keep hummingbirds on their continuous cycles of coming and going. Oh, uh, it's a total privilege. Meet Roy and Ruby, the newest members of the William Brown family. Barb and Bill have been ranchers most of their lives. People have this romantic idea of branching, and it can be, but it's also a lot of work. I've got five horses out there, I don't need five horses. I don't have any cows anymore, but I don't know how to quit. <laughs> There's no doubt Bill is still a cowboy at heart, but he no longer rides the range. I would probably still be in ranching, but the cost of being in ranching is just prohibitive nowadays. You work all year long, you might make, if you're lucky, you break even. So Bill and Barb pulled up stakes in Colorado and moved the horses to Tombstone, Arizona. They're still involved in the ranching industry, just in a different way. This just rounds the edges up and gives it a finished look. Bill is a holster maker, but not just any holster maker. I have a hard time making a plain holster with nothing on it. You see all that blank leather there, and it's, you know, you want to put something on it. <laughs> His specialty is carving leather, creating images that tell the story of another time. There was a point where, as we were doing this business and people were coming in, it took me a while to figure out what these people were after because of the B. Westerns and the John Wayne and Hopalong and all of those. Gene Autry. These people are trying to recreate in their lives what I grew up with. I have to establish a border on here for the pattern that goes on it. Bill grew up down the road in Bisbee. 
but decided to establish his business in the town too tough to die. Tombstone is sort of like the mecca for cowboys. I don't think Hollywood would have a Western if it hadn't been for Tombstone because of the gunfight, White Earp. You almost expect Wyatt or Doc to walk into this mom and pop shop. The smell of oil and leather hang in the air, like the aroma of fresh brewed coffee. Everything we've ever done, we jump in with both feet and it's either gonna make it or it's not. And plus, I can't work for anybody. I worked for the railroad for five years and it was a good job and it was from the day I hired out trying to figure out how not to work there. In the end, it was the hobby he learned as a boy that carried him into his future. You know, I just thought we might make a wage with it, but it's, it's actually been pretty good for us. So, Plus, I've got a guy that works for me that between the two of us would make enough to support us both. So, Finding someone to do leather work at the level Bill required was no easy task. There are only about 50 craftsmen in the country. Back when I was about, oh, I don't know, four or five years old, the main thing on the TV uh, were, the, were the westerns, the, the weekly westerns. Uh, and I was glued to the screen whenever they were on. I didn't care about much of anything else. A young cowboy was born. Apart from my, my good family upbringing, I learned most of my other morals from watching The Lone Ranger and other types of shows like that. Today, Colin Taylor delights tourists with his own rendition of his boyhood hero. And the amazing thing? Well, Colin was a tourist. He was coming over here twice a year, coming in my shop. And he'd hang around, but he never told me that he was a holster maker in England. And while he may have grown up thousands of miles away in County Durham, his heart was in America. He knows more about American history than people who live here. I feel this is where I was meant to be. I'm doing something I do enjoy and, and nothing stops that enjoyment. It just keeps getting better every day. After working together for several years, the cowboy and the Brit are silent companions in a backroom workshop filled with their grandfather's tools. This works like a, a small jackhammer. That thing is not down on the leather, but you're bouncing it. Bill and Colin copy patterns of chaps and belts and holsters from old movies and use vintage saddle catalogs as guides. I've got a friend, he's a retired saddle maker. If he gets an old saddle, he tears it completely apart just to see how they built it. And then he'll put them all back together. Well, that's a lot of work, but that's, that's how you figure this stuff out, how you learn it. It's like having an old craftsman from 100 years ago teach you how they did it. Bill doesn't call leather carving an art. He thinks of it as a craft, one that he doesn't plan on giving up anytime soon. It's hard to retire from something that you like doing that really didn't work. Well, a friend of mine that just recently died was 95. He was still working when he died. They found him watching the Western Channel in his chair. <laughs> Bill says he'll be carving till... Oh, probably till they throw dirt in my face. <laughs> you know, why quit? I have all this stuff. <laughs> why indeed. This cowboy at heart will always be at home on the range as long as he has his wife by his side, stock in the corral, and his grandfather's carving tools in hand.
I came known for doing very large paintings of very ugly, shamanistic type people. Lawrence Lee made a successful career out of painting those types of images. Men, women, sometimes androgynous figures. Through my career, I came to discover that people from all over the globe came to Tucson looking for paintings of Indians. After decades of doing similar work, he became less inspired to produce them. Lee found gallery owners and clients weren't so quick to go with him on a different artistic adventure. Finally, he could stand it no longer and committed to exploring a new avenue. In fact, he paved his own road by creating a new art form. I can rotate it or do whatever I want, change the shape. Each one is created entirely on the computer, some with photos he's taken and most with 3D images manipulated with sophisticated graphics software. But it really is amazing what these people do and what can be done with this. And you see, if I was a painter, I wouldn't have this opportunity. I would have to preconceive, I'd have to know what I wanted and then paint it. And here, instead, I can check everything out first. I see that that's going to end up being too dark. Lee named his new art form. The term created uh, does not fall trippingly off the lips but it is a giclarun. A giclarun is a made-up word. Sounds sort of like gicle, so you have that French flavor. Gicle comes from the French, meaning to spray, and gicles are usually large format inkjet reproductions of digital images. Lee's giclaruns are different. A giclarun is, is a one-off. It's a one-only. There is only one in the world. The Giclaroons are vivid images, full of color with the flavor of the Southwest. What I've noticed is that Making the break from, print, from painting has allowed me personally as an artist to finally grow again for the first time in many years and to uh, investigate subject matter that I wouldn't have bothered to investigate uh, before when I was a painter. It's an old saying that um, a painting is never finished, it's merely abandoned. And that's another thing that's so good about working with a computer because I don't have to worry about finishing something and I can abandon a piece in many stages and go back and try them out again later. The vibrant Giclerunes are even more impressive when you consider Lee is red-green colorblind. And it's probably one reason that I tend to paint in such uh, bright primary colors, because they're easy for me to see. If you look closely, you may see something that has carried over from Lee's previous work. For years, I've included uh, in many paintings, and I, in most of the things I do now, uh, what I call a cognitive dissonance. But it actually is, is some, some little twist, like a plot twist in a novel, that requires the person that's looking at the piece of art to participate in the piece of art, rather than just standing back and admiring it, because you don't quite know why that thing is there. And you make up a story to resolve the dissonance in your head because you don't want to walk away uh, all uh, out of tune. Lee is working to create awareness and understanding of his giclaroons, a slow process he knows well from his previous attempts at new artistic endeavors. 
Whenever I tried to go in a new direction, I tried to do it with relatively baby steps. But it would take a year and a half to two years before people would come along behind me. The problem was the galleries didn't have that kind of time to spend. Bohemia in the Lost Barrio has been supportive of his new endeavor, and Lee is also working on a more grassroots effort. He recently donated several prints on paper to the Flying Samaritans. It was an agave with fireworks coming from the spout. Whether the Giclaroons will be widely accepted has yet to be determined, but Lee has no doubt he made the right decision to grow as an artist. Well, the response has been good, and uh, I hope to, make, uh, hope to take advantage of uh, the medium of computers to, and the internet uh, to make these pieces available, not to just a gallery market, but to people that have an interest in art, people that have just an interest in decorating their walls all over the world. Angels and saints adorn the walls. A child king looks on from above. Milagros symbolizing hopes for healing. A lighted candle, a whispered prayer. A sense of peace and comfort descends on all who enter. Reverence for this holy place has been shared by countless souls for more than two centuries. Hidden within are spaces rarely experienced. Daniel Morales is among the few. Morales knows these passages well, every crack, and every creek. This is one place inside Mission San Javier del Bac most will never see, a claustrophobic seven-story stairway. So they have a tunnel in here that actually takes you down, downstairs. It's kind of in an arch form, and up above it has, it actually has weight on top of it. Understanding the structure and what it's made of is Morales' job. Oh, it was made well. <laughs> Somebody really knew what they're doing when they're building it. And the builders are still at it. Two hundred years pass, and the mission continues to be a work in progress. With his crew, contractor Daniel Morales leads the way. Hey, Daryl, hey, pull this bucket up. Just... Climbing skyward, Morales' men head to their stations on the West Tower, each with his own task. Another no talk triple play coming up next. And each with his own music. As the work above progresses, a nonstop pilgrimage continues below. Local parishioners mix almost seamlessly with visitors from all over the world. I come to church every day almost. <laughs> Sometimes we forget where we're at, <laughs> you know, typical construction type guys. <laughs> but, I mean, we really respect the, the church. From a distance, the white dove of the desert is a picture of perfection. But decades of sun, wind, and rain have opened cracks in the coating, allowing moisture to seep in, threatening the integrity of the structure and everything held inside. To protect the church from the elements, previous crews have tried and failed with a variety of materials. Just about any loop paint, um, asphalt, chicken wire, lathing, concrete, 
cement and mortar, just about anything that somebody thought tough head. Though applied with good intention, more problems were created than solved. So, with his men, Morales is removing it all and starting over. For this stonemason, it's not just a job, it's a mission. What's important to me is the, the crew, this job, the building, you know, making sure it's done, um, done right. Every little thing we do, you know, all of us, we put a lot of pride into it. Um, we pour a lot of heart into it. We want to make sure it's going to outlast us long after we're gone and that nobody would ever have to do it again. We're actually putting in control joints now into the dome. Morales' soft-spoken manner comes alive as he describes the task at hand. We're starting to build up to plaster, pre-plaster the high tower, excavate it first, and get it all ready. Watch it, the dust, the spine chips that fall. Morales says the recipe for the new coat on San Javier goes back to the 1700s. No concrete or asphalt, just lime, sand, and one more ingredient unique to the Sonoran Desert. Near the scaffold, the crew's mix master, Basil Murillo, extracts cactus juice from the prickly pear. How the juice is made, and exactly how much goes into the mortar, he won't say. The formula for the mortar is a trade secret, and even then, the mix varies according to heat, humidity, and time of the year. Unlike concrete, lime mortar is slow to cure but the result is an uncommon durability. The techniques used by Morales took generations to develop, from his great-grandfather to his grandfather, then onto his father, who's still at work on the crew. All descend from those who first built the mission. All are Native Americans. San Javier is probably the outstanding Spanish Baroque mission in the United States and certainly anything that represents the history, the, this expression of faith that this building represents is worthy of all the effort that anyone can give it. Boom, boom, boom with this light effect. Bunny Fontana is an expert on San Javier and is a member of the Patronato, the organization in charge of the mission's conservation. Okay. Th this is the, uh, the, the heavenly and earthly trinity that, that's painted here. To protect the mission, and thereby the artwork inside, the Patronato have placed their faith in Morales. Certainly there are other people who are, who are masons and who are plasterers, but over the years, the, the, the Morales family have, over their years and years of experience working on this particular building, made themselves absolutely unique in what they do. Behind the restoration is the desire to preserve the mission, not just for today, but for generations to come. Morales is determined to see it through. I think it'll be good. I mean, it's something that we've accomplished, but that's me and my crew, my whole crew. I mean, that, that's something that we'll all be able to stand back and, and look at it and say, you know, we did that. What's most important are those who believe in the value of the mission and work to keep its spirit alive for all who enter. We're part of this place. Um, just working on it so much and having our hands on, on touching the bricks and the mortar, you, you just, it just becomes part of you. We are Tucson. Tucson 12.